Okay, uh, here we go with this week's homework review, Chapter 3, Homework 1. I uh, did not have a chance to look at the averages. Let me see real quick. Full screen that. All right, so this week, um, again, last, last set of topics before the exam. Uh, if we go to the results for this homework real quick, we saw that the average score was 9.22. So again, um, things getting a little bit lower. Now keep in mind this was as of Monday morning. Um, we did extend the deadline for this one to Monday night because of the ill-timed blackboard crash that many of you experienced Sunday night. Um, maybe that's a lesson to start doing the homework earlier, probably not. Uh, but at any rate, um, you do have until Monday night to finish this if you still have attempts remaining, but I am going to do the homework review video now just to make sure that people that did finish the homework early are able to benefit from this before they take their exam. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, first couple are requests from students, and um, this was one of the requests was to complete the Lewis structure for this molecule. Um, now, I went through this a little bit in the exam review, but we didn't see this in class, so it's understandable that there's still a little bit of confusion on this. So we're going to complete this Lewis structure, and then we have to figure out how many single and double bonds it has. Now, one thing about the way this formula is written is we see these things that, that say CH3. So whenever you see hydrogen especially coming right after a carbon in the formula or the, or the structure, so CH3, we have a CH there, we have another CH3 up there, that means that all, all of those hydrogens that are indicated, whether it be one, two, or three, or whatever, are gonna be bonded to that carbon. So if we wanna draw this structure out a little bit more explicitly, the first group, which is CH3, the first carbon, is gonna have three hydrogens bonded to it. And then this carbon is going to be bonded to the next one, which is labeled as CH, which means that's going to have one hydrogen on it. And then that carbon is going to be bonded to one that has three hydrogens, so another CH3. So we're just going to write out the hydrogens a little bit more explicitly so we can see them and so we can count the bonds and the electrons more uh, easily. So that's the first part of the molecule. And then we have over here a C with an oxygen, another carbon, and a nitrogen. All right, so we have this sort of setup. And as we talked about in the exam review, for these types of organic structures that have mostly carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, there's some patterns that we want to follow. Now, we can still follow the full process. We can count the valence electrons. We can complete octets. We can verify formal charges. But because there's so many atoms in this structure that we have to worry about, it's helpful to start with these patterns that I'm going to show you here. So obviously, hydrogen is just going to form one bond. And then for the rest of the two P elements that are commonly in these structures, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen being the big ones, these all want to have a complete octet, so they want to have eight total valence electrons, and they also will typically have zero formal charge because these types of molecules are typically charge neutral, and there's few exceptions where you would see formal charges in these. So for carbon, the way you do that is with just four bonds. So every carbon in this molecule should have exactly four bonds and no lone pairs at all. Nitrogen tends to have three bonds and one lone pair. And when we say when we're counting the number of bonds, that's going to be a combination of single, double, and triple that adds up to three, so three total bonds. And then oxygen would be two of each, two bonds, and two lone pairs. So keep in mind, all of these will have eight electrons around them. Each bond is two, each lone pair is two, so a total of eight for carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But they tend to have different combinations of bonding and non-bonding electrons. And then if we had a, a halogen in our structure, like a fluorine or a chlorine, um, is one of the outer atoms in this type of structure, those would get, sorry, one bond and three lone pairs, right in the same order. One bond and three. So all of these will have complete octets, and if you follow this pattern, you'll also minimize formal charges. So if we go through this structure here, we have this first carbon already has four bonds, one, two, three, four. This second carbon has four bonds, one, two, three, four. This carbon up here has four bonds, one, two, three, four. So those three carbons, these first three in the structure, are not going to get any multiple bonds. And remember, carbon will never have lone pairs in these type of structures. But if we go to this carbon here, at, at, at the moment it only has three bonds, one, two, three. It wants to have four. This oxygen only has one bond, and it wants to have two. So we fix that by drawing a double bond. That gives this carbon four bonds. This oxygen has two bonds, and it will also have two lone pairs to complete its octet. And then if we go to this last carbon here, this currently has only two bonds, and this nitrogen only has one bond. 
Carbon wants to have four, nitrogen wants to have three, so we, we fix that by making this into a triple bond. That gives this carbon a total of four bonds, and this nitrogen a total of three, and then it will also have a lone pair to complete its octet. So that's the final structure. We don't really care about lone pairs in this question specifically, but you should have them in for completeness. And that's what it's going to look like. Every carbon has four bonds. This nitrogen has three bonds and a lone pair. The oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs. So that matches the pattern, and that gives us the correct number of electrons and, and uh, no formal charges. So if we, look, if we count single bonds, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I counted 11 single bonds. hope I did that right. And then multiple bonds. Remember, a multiple bond is either a double or triple bond, anything besides a single. So multiple, we just count doubles or triples. Double, not duple. Come on, Tom. All right, double or triple bonds. We have one double bond, one triple bond. So two of our bonds would be multiple bonds. All right, so that's how we approach problems like this. In this chapter, we're going to be, again, doing just Lewis structures as we did here. But we will continue this in chapter four when we start talking about bonding and, and to some extent, geometry and how that relates to these types of Lewis structures. All right, the next request from a student, we had a few problems like this that I'll go over um, that were difficult for us and it was to pick the member of each pair with a greater bond energy. So if we're talking about bond energy or bond strength as it's sometimes called or often called, the two things we look at, we look at the bond order so if the two atoms in the bond are the same, or if they're at least you know similar locations on the periodic table, the higher the bond order, so if you have a, your bond order is increasing, your bond strength will increase. So those two are directly related. And that's simply the first one you want to look at because the effect of bond strength, the, sorry, the effect of bond order on the bond strength is pretty huge. So you want to look at bond order first. And if you have a, a higher bond order, you should automatically zoom in on that as being the one that has the stronger bond. The second thing you look at then, if, if you have uh, situations where the bond orders are the same, is to look at the bond length. And these two are inversely related. So as the bond length increases, the bond strength decreases. So again, inverse relationship for those two. The way, as we'll see, the way that we rank bond length is by the sizes of the atoms. So we now know from chapter two, we have periodic trends for atomic radius, and the combination of the two atomic radii is, is essentially what the length of that bond is. So two small atoms bonded together gives a short bond, two large atoms gives a long bond, and that then relates to bond strength in this way. So if we have these three choices here, we just want to pick the member of each pair that has the greater bond energy. So if we have CF or CL for the first one, those have the same bond order, so we just have to think about bond length. And if we look at the periodic table, the, both of these bonds have carbon in them. And then we have to figure out, is, is fluorine or chlorine bigger or smaller? So we have fluorine and chlorine are the two atoms that carbon is bonded to in, these, in this comparison. Fluorine is above chlorine, so it's going to be the smaller of the two. So we would expect CF to, be the, to have the greater bond energy. It's the shorter bond, so it has the greater bond energy. All right, and again, because fluorine is smaller than chlorine, we expect this bond to be shorter and stronger. For the second one, we look at carbon-carbon bond in C2H4 or the bond in F2. So we have to draw Lewis structures for these because the bond orders were not explicitly stated. So for C2H4, way we draw that again is um, we distribute the hydrogens evenly. Um, C2H4, and then each carbon should have four bonds. So if we look at this, these carbons each have three bonds, so we're going to get a double bond there. All right, so this is going to be a C-C double bond that we're, that we're looking at for C2H4. Uh, we could have done that a little bit longer process, obviously, by counting the total electrons, but again, for this one, I just followed the patterns I gave you in the last uh, example. Uh, and then finally for F2, we have fluorine each has seven valence electrons, so we have 14 electrons. We start with a single bond. We complete the octets, and that's going to end up being all 14 of our electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 being the two from the bond. So it's going to be a single bond. All right, and again, here we're comparing a double bond to a single bond. These two are 
pretty similar locations on the PR table, both 2P elements, so we don't have to worry about radius for this one. This one's going to be the stronger bond. So CF stronger here, and then this carbon-carbon bond is the stronger for the second one because it's a double bond versus a single bond. And then finally, choice three, I ran out of room, so I'll do it up here. This one's pretty straightforward. CO or C double bond or single bond or double bond. Remember, higher bond order is greater bond energy, so we're going to pick the carbon oxygen double bond for that one. All right, so that's how we approach this one. It's combination of bond order and bond length. We have to think about both of them here, but the bond order is the one you want to look at first. Higher bond order will mean larger bond strength, and only if we're comparing bonds that have the same bond order would we start thinking about the length of that bond based on the sizes of the atoms. All right, and then this next problem here is basically identical. Uh, so we're going to rank the bond orders from weakest to strongest. Um, and what we have here is all of the silicon halide bonds. So we're looking at silicon bonded to all of the group seven elements. So that's going to be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine bonded, all bonded to silicon. And again, these are all single bonds. So they all have the same bond order. So then what we want to do if we're looking for weakest to strongest, we want to rank them in reality going from longest to shortest. The weakest bond is going to be the longest, the strongest bond is going to be the shortest, and in terms of atomic radius of the halogen elements that these are all bonded to, the, long, the largest halogen is going to be the one that's the furthest down, which is iodine, and then bromine, then chlorine, then fluorine. So that's their ordering in atomic radius. Iodine is the largest, then bromine, chlorine, and fluorine. And so that means in terms of bond length, the silicon iodine is going to be the longest, and then the silicon bromine. Again, if they're bonded to a larger atom, it's going to be a longer bond. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. And so that's the ordering in terms of bond length, and then it's just going to be the opposite in terms of bond energy. So weakest to strongest, or bond strength. Silicon iodine would be the weakest, and then they would go through this series in this way. All right, so it's iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine. Iodine, chlorine, bromine, fluorine. That's going to be choice. D here. All right, so you have to make sure you get those in the right order, but it's longest to shortest, which also gives you then weakest to strongest. All right, the next property we had to deal with for bonds is polarity. So remember that for polarity, we're looking at if we have the most polar bond, here we're looking for least polar bond, but uh, let me write this differently then. All right, so for polarity, we're looking at difference in electronegativity. So we have two atoms bonded to each other. They each have their own electronegativity, and, be, and the difference between those is what's going to dictate the polarity of the bond. Now, I will freely admit that this question is pretty difficult. So this is, these are not the easiest comparisons to do. I'm pretty sure all the ones on the test will be a little bit more straightforward than this. Um, so I think for this one, it would have been helpful to have at least some of the electronegativity values. Because again, if we know the individual electronegativities, we can just subtract the two, and that difference is going to tell us how polar or nonpolar the bond is. Um, now I think the ones that we can compare first, we're looking for the least polar bonds. So the ones that have this, that share an element, so we have carbon oxygen, carbon fluorine, and carbon iodine. Um, if we look at the periodic table, when we look at the difference in electronegativity, so carbon is, is constant in all of these, and which ones is it different than, um, we can see that carbon oxygen is a polar bond because carbon and oxygen have different electronegativities. As we move to the right, we get more electronegative, so oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Fluorine is even more electronegative than that. So between these two, carbon fluorine is going to be more polar than carbon oxygen. And then carbon oxygen versus carbon iodine. This is not necessarily the easiest comparison. So carbon oxygen is clearly polar. Carbon iodine, it's a little bit hard to compare because as we go from carbon to iodine, we move to the right, which increases electronegativity, but then we move down, which decreases it. And it's actually, this is a helpful benchmark to remember because for carbon and iodine, if we go, we go three over, one, two, three, then we go three down, one, two, three. 
you can almost think of it as those two effects cancel each other, moving to the right by three, moving down by three. And as it turns out, and this is a helpful, I'm gonna write down some benchmarks that are helpful to remember for problems like this. Carbon and iodine have the same electronegativity. So a bond between carbon and iodine is basically nonpolar. So of these three bonds with carbon in them, this one is pretty close to nonpolar, so that's going to be the least polar of these ones. Now we have to compare carbon iodine, which we've established is pretty much nonpolar because they have the same electronegativity. Let's compare it to the rest. So if we have ClF, again, it would be hard to compare ClF to all of these different bonds, but chlorine and fluorine clearly have different electronegativities. As we go up between chlorine and fluorine, electronegativity increases. Fluorine is the most electronegative. So this bond will be polar. We don't know how, you know, we don't have to necessarily compare it to all the rest of these to figure out which is more or less polar because we're not ranking all these. We just want to find the least polar bond. And this one is polar, so we can eliminate it as well. So we've eliminated CO, CLF, and CF. Now we're left with CI and SIH. And again, it's a little bit hard to tell here between these two. We said that this one is basically nonpolar, so it's probably going to be our choice. Now, what about silicon hydrogen? Is that polar or nonpolar? It's not a very easy comparison because hydrogen is over here. It's kind of displaced from where it should be because it's a nonmetal. Silicon is way over here. So another helpful benchmark to remember for hydrogen is that, um, because again, hydrogen is kind of out of place on the periodic table. So it's not really a not, it's not really a metal, even though it's on the left side. It is a nonmetal. So hydrogen and silicon have the same electronegativity. Again, we don't want to need to memorize all of the electronegativity. That's obviously a, a huge task and not very useful one. But hydrogen, because it's way over here on the left, it's hard to really know how to compare it to the nonmetals that it typically bonds to. So hydrogen is the same as silicons, or sorry, the same as phosphorus. So a phosphorus hydrogen bond is basically nonpolar. That means silicon is a little bit less electronegative than hydrogen because it's to the left of phosphorus, which is where hydrogen really would be if, in terms of electronegativity. So silicon is less electronegative than hydrogen, so this bond would also be polar. Silicon hydrogen bonds are not very polar, but they are a little bit polar. We've established that carbon iodine is nonpolar, so this is going to end up being our choice for the least polar. Again, this is a difficult one to do, but if we keep these benchmarks in mind, Carbon and iodine have the same electronegativity. Hydrogen and silicon have the same. Those are useful ones to remember because we are going to look at a lot of, and if you take organic chemistry, look at even more of these. Bonds between carbon and halogens are very common. Carbon fluorine, carbon chlorine, carbon iodine, carbon bromine, and so on. And then hydrogen, again, because of its weird location on the periodic table, it's helpful to remember that it's, and I, I wrote that wrong, it should be hydrogen and phosphorus have the same electronegativity. I've been confusing you guys this whole time probably because of that. Mistake. Anyway, hydrogen and phosphorus have the same electronegativity, which means that silicon and hydrogen are a little bit different. Um, another thing to remember, of course, is that fluorine is the most electronegative, oxygen is second. All right, and so again, if we you know look at these three elements over here, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, nitrogen are pretty much all of the most electronegative. Fluorine is the most, oxygen is second. Nitrogen and chlorine are about the same. So it's helpful, again, to keep some of those in mind, which ones are the most electronegative. All right, so like I said, this is not the most straightforward one. It's not surprising that the, um, you know, the success rate on this question was not particularly high. Um, but when you're looking at polarity, you do need to look at differences in electronegativity. It doesn't matter what the individual electronegativities are. We can't just look at one atom in the bond and tell if it's, if it's a polar bond or not. You have to look at both atoms and see which ones are the most or least different from each other, whether we're looking for the most or least polar. All right, the next question we're going to go over is dealing with um, formal charges. So this was another topic. We had a, a few of these that we had trouble with, and so we have to learn how to calculate formal charge. And of course, to do that, we still we need to have a good Lewis structure first. So let's start with that. We have NO2 minus, which has nitrogen, oxygen, and a negative charge. That's going to give us our electrons. So if we go to the periodic table, Nitrogen is group 5, so that contributes 5 valence electrons. Oxygen is group 6, so each of those contributes 6. So we have 5 electrons from nitrogen. We have 2 times 6, which is 12 from oxygen. 
then our negative charge adds one. So this is going to be an 18 electron structure. Did I calculate that right? 17 plus 1 is 18, correct? All right, so 18 electrons for NO2 minus. And again, the way we do this is we start with single bonds. Nitrogen at the center, single bonds to each oxygen. We complete the octet on each oxygen by adding six more. So again, you should, you, if you're going to be ready for the test this week, you need to be able to do this very quickly and efficiently. You can't spend 10 minutes drawing a loose structure. That's not in your best interest. So try to get these steps down and get them, you know, get a lot of practice on them. So again, we start with single bonds. We complete octets. That is now a total of 16 electrons, eight for each oxygen, two from the bond, six from the lone pairs. So we have two more, and those two go in the central atom. Now, if you look at this structure, the first thing we want to evaluate is octet rule. We completed the octets of each oxygen, but if we look at our nitrogen here, it currently has two, four, six electrons. So we need to complete the octet on the central atom. Nitrogen is one that should not violate the octet rule, or at least not very often. So we're going to complete the octet rule. It can never go beyond eight electrons for nitrogen, but it should also not have less than eight. So we only have six, so what we're going to do is we're going to take one of our lone pairs and make it into a double bond. So again, it doesn't matter which lone pair we take or which oxygen we do, we get one double bond that removes one of the lone pairs from that oxygen. We don't take the lone pair off of nitrogen, and this is going to be our final structure, again, with a negative charge. Now, the other thing we should keep in mind, too, is that this has resonance. It's not important for this question, but there's actually two equivalent structures we could draw where we could put the double bond on the left side as well. So we could get this structure also, which is equivalent, and it also has one double bond between nitrogen and oxygen. Now what this question asked though for was the formal charge on nitrogen. So if we look at nitrogen's formal charge, again the way we do formal charge is we start with the number of valence electrons that the atom has. The atom has five valence electrons, so that's our starting point. We subtract from that the number of electrons that come from bonds, or in other words the number of bonds that it has, where we're assuming that those bonding electrons are shared. So the number of bonds that nitrogen have is one, two, three. A double bond and a single bond is a total of three bonds. And then we subtract the number of non-bonding electrons. In these structures, nitrogen has one lone pair, or a total of two non-bonding electrons. So 5 minus 3 minus 2 is 0. That means the nitrogen has zero formal charge. In these structures, you're going to have zero formal charge on nitrogen. If we calculate it for oxygen, it'd also be minus 1 for that one and zero for that one. So there's a total of negative one charge, so there should be a formal charge somewhere, but it's going to be on oxygen, not on nitrogen. So nitrogen has zero formal charge. There's a few questions with formal charge that we didn't do, didn't do great on, so definitely review that topic as you prepare for the exam. All right, the next couple will deal with ions and their radius and their electron configuration. So here we're looking at a comparison of ions. Now remember, we can't just use periodic trends for ions because they have different numbers of electrons. So many of you are familiar with the periodic trend that the radius decreases as you go left to right, it increases as you go top to bottom, and you, and you try to use that for these ones. But when we're dealing with ions, the first thing we need to think about is how many electrons do these have? You know, how many electrons do they have? Where do those, you know, which subshells are those electrons in, and so on. So if we go to S2 minus, Cl minus, argon, K plus, calcium 2 plus. S2 minus has sulfur has 16, we add 2, so we have 18 electrons. Cl minus, chlorine has 17 electrons, Cl minus would have 18. We have argon, which has 18 electrons. K plus, K has 19 electrons, but then we take off one, so it has 18 electrons for K plus. Calcium, 20 electrons, remove two electrons. Calcium two plus is 18. So all of these have 18 electrons, which means they all have the same electron configurations. 18 electrons, 18 electrons, 18 electrons, 18 electrons. All of these have the argon configuration. So they have the same number of electrons, same subshell, for all those electrons. So what's going to determine the radius then is the number of protons in the nucleus. So if you have the same number of electrons, if you look at the number of protons, more protons is going to pull the electrons closer to it, so that's going to give you a smaller radius. Or another way of thinking about this is if you have isoelectronic ions, those are ones that have the same number of electrons like these do, yeah, isoelectronic species, you're going to have, in terms of radius, you're going to have positive charge is going to be the smallest, 
neutral in the middle, negative charge largest. Again, this is going to have more protons if you have a positive charge, less protons if you have a negative charge, dealing with species that have all the same electrons. So these are all isoelectronics. All we have to rate them in terms of is their charge. The one that has the highest charge is going to be calcium, the highest positive charge, and so that one would be smallest. So if we are actually ranking these, calcium 2 plus would be the smallest, then calcium plus because it has a 1 plus charge, argon in the middle, which is neutral, Cl minus is going to be larger, and then F2 minus the largest. But the smallest one, which we're looking for, is calcium 2 plus. All right, so for ranking sizes of ions, we can't think just about the periodic table. We have to think about how many electrons and how many protons they have. And in a situation like this, where they have the same number of electrons, the comparison becomes very straightforward. Just rank them in order of charge, positive being the smallest, negative being the largest, okay, in terms of radius. All right, next question also deals with ions. We're looking for the charge and the ground state electron configuration of the monatomic ion most likely to be formed by each element. So here we're looking at selenium, Se. So first let's look at the charge. So selenium is a group six element. So just like all the other group six elements, it tends to gain two electrons to become a noble gas configuration. So the expected charge for selenium is gonna be two minus, just like it is for sulfur above it, just like it is for oxygen above that. The expected charge is two minus. Now all of these have SC two minus as the charge, so none of these have the wrong charge for the ion. But then looking at the electron configuration for SC two minus now, which is what we're looking at here is the ion, the electron configuration for SC two minus is gonna be the same as krypton. It has 36 electrons, so it'll be the same configuration. Now these all write the electron configuration out in full detail, so we have to go through that now, which is a little bit annoying, but we have for krypton over here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and then 4p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Again, a lot of subshells here to consider, so the full configuration is krypton, which is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. All right, so that's going to be the full configuration for s2 minus, which is the same as krypton. Again, when we're adding electrons to anions, we just keep adding them into the unoccupied subshell. So the valence configuration for selenium, the last electrons go into 4p4, but we can still add two more, so this last one's gonna be 4p6 for the valence. That's what we have here. Um, so again, a lot of letters and numbers in these configurations, but let's look at the ones that at least have 4p6 in them, because that should be the last subshell. So this one says 4p2, so that's wrong. This one says 4p4, that's wrong. This one says 4p8, there's no such thing as 4p8. You can't have more than six. This one has 4p6, but then it has a, two more electrons beyond that, and 5s, which shouldn't be there. So that shouldn't be there either. So this is wrong also. So the correct answer for these is none of these. Again, I recognize it's always a little bit disconcerting to pick none of these as the answer. That's often the reason why some of these have the lower success rates, but none of these configurations end with 4p6. None of them have this correct ordering of subshells. So this one adds two more to the 5s, which it shouldn't do. This one takes out two electrons, but it should add two. This one is the neutral configuration for selenium, not SC2 minus, ends in 4p4. And this one, again, we added too many electrons, 4p8 should be 4p6. So the correct answer for this would be none of these. All right, finally, the last question we'll go through is we have, we're given a bunch of bond energies here. So we talked about how to compare bond energies. Now we're gonna use them to calculate delta E for reactions. So we have X2 and CX are these two numbers. This had variable inputs, so the numbers that you got might not be exactly the same, but the process will be. And then we have the bond energies for carbon-carbon single and carbon-carbon double bonds, given as 338 and 604. We want to know what is delta E for this reaction. So for these types of problems, we do need to know the bond orders that are involved. So we have to write out Lewis structures. We did C2H4 earlier. Again, we distribute the hydrogens equally. And what we end up with is in this structure, each carbon only has three bonds. We have to add a double bond between those. We get a double bond between the carbons. X2, we don't really know the bond order, but we're told the bond energy, so we don't really have to draw that out. There's only one X2 bond energy given. And then in the product, we have C2H4X2. Again, 
when you're drawing formulas like this, you need to just distribute things equally. So two hydrogens on each side as before, and then one X on each side. In this structure, we already have four bonds for each carbon. One, two, three, four, one to the carbon, two to hydrogen, one to X. So we don't draw a double bond here. We leave it as a carbon-carbon single bond. So then what we need to do is we need to figure out, again, the sum of the bond energies on the reactant side, sum of the bond energies on the product side, and subtract them. One thing that's missing here, though, is what is the CH bond energy? We're not given that, and these both have carbon-hydrogen bonds. But what we'll notice, then, is that on each side we have four CH bonds. One, two, three, four over here. One, two, three, four over there. When we subtract products from reactants, those would cancel each other out. And so we don't actually need to know this CH bond association energy. It is an unknown, but and we could have used it if we were given it, but we don't need it because it's the same number of CH bonds on both sides. So on the reactant side, we sum up the bond energies. We have four CH bonds. We don't know that number, so we'll just write it as four times CH. We have, as you'll see, we don't need it. We have a carbon-carbon double bond, so we're gonna add that in. That's gonna be one carbon-carbon double bond. And the number that we're given for CC double bonds is 604. And then finally, we have the X2 bond. Again, not knowing the bond order, but only given one energy for that, which is 156. So the sum of the bond energies on the reactant side is going to be 760 kilojoules plus four times whatever CH is. As I said, these are gonna cancel out, so we don't even really need to consider them, but I'll show you when we do the math again that they do cancel out. And then on the product side, I'm gonna have to add another page here, so let me figure out how to do that. Um, pause this for a second. All right, sorry, I needed one more page to be able to uh, finish the work here. All right, so that's the reactant side. Then we do the same thing on the products. On the product side, we have still four CH bonds, so we don't know what that number is. We have, in this case, a CC single bond. So the carbon-carbon single bond energy is 338, so to make sure we use the right numbers for the correct carbon-carbon bond order. And then we have two CX bonds, CX over here, CX over there. And the CX bond energy we were said, we were told is 257. So that number is going to be 514. So on the product side, we do four CHs. And then the number here is 338 plus 514, which is 852. All right, and then again, if we want to do delta E, it's going to be using this approach, reactants minus products. Some of the bond energy of the reactants minus products. And so what we get on the reactant side, as we said, was 760 kilojoules plus four times whatever the CH bonds are. We subtract from that 852 kilojoules plus whatever four times the CH bonds are. And the unknown CH bond energies cancel out, plus four minus four. And then what we're left with is just 760 minus 852 which is minus 92 kilojoules. So we would expect the bond energy, or the, sorry, the delta E for this reaction to be minus 92 kilojoules, and that's how we would use bond energies to determine that. All right, so that takes us to the end of this week's video. Um, again, if you have any last minute questions before your exam on, on this assignment or any of the previous ones, um, please come find me and I'd be happy to help you out with that. All right, I will see you in class and good luck with the exam this week.